What is up, brothers and sisters? It's Jay Campbell, and you're listening to the Jay Campbell Podcast. Join me for regular deep dives with amazing beings whose work is manifesting a golden age. And remember, you create your reality by your focused thoughts, conscious words, and intentional actions. Raise your vibration to optimize your love creation. Hey guys, what is going on? Of course, it's Jay Campbell, the founder of the Jay Campbell Podcast. And I'm very, very excited today to be joined in my Zoom virtual studio during the COVID madness by Victor Mifsud, who is also known as the Blind Biohacker. Victor has an amazing story, which we're going to get into in a second. But first, Victor, what's going on, brother? How are you? I'm doing great, Jay. Thanks for having me on the show, man. Excited to be here. It's an honor to have you. Um, so just real quick on his bio, um, Victor and I have known each other now, dude, since going back to December. Yeah. yeah. And he reached out to me. He is a guy who is essentially, as he says in his bio, in his documentary, um, attempting to biohack his vision back. And he has worked with some of the leading um, peptide physicians and researchers. Um, his bio or documentary, which I've watched, which is absolutely amazing, is called My Neuroplastic Adventure. And he's interviewed all sorts of doctors and scientists, uh, including Dr. Gabor Mate, did I pronounce that right, hopefully, who's a Canadian research chair in neurobiology of motor learning, Dr. Laura Boyd, and also the New York Times bestselling author, Dr. Norman Deutsch, um, to name a few. Again, he works with Dr. William Seeds, who's been on my podcast. Um, he's an amazing guy. And probably one of the one things I love about him the most is he's also very high conscious. He's done plant medicine, he walks the walk and talks the talk, and it's an honor to have him on the show today. Um, so, Victor, first, as I always do on this podcast, before we jump into some of the topics and talk about your documentary, man, how did you get on the Jay Campbell podcast today? How did I get here? Good question. Well, I've, I've been following the world of peptides for about a year, and uh, your stuff always kept popping up in my feed. You had great guests, you know, like Ryan Smith and Seeds and you know, talking about the power and potential of, of peptides. So, you know, I, I've been biohacking my eyes for the past 10 years. And as soon as I got woke to peptides, it's like, I need to try this stuff. And I just went down a major rabbit hole. And, uh, and then I really liked when you transformed into the new format, Jay Campbell podcast. About awesome, man. Consciousness. And that's a big part of uh, my biohacking, because I think sure. it's very important to, to biohack your inner world and outer world. Uh, together, which some people just do one or the other and forget about that world. So I think it's important to do both. And uh, yeah, as soon as you know, you switched over to doing this, it's like, I, I need to connect with you. I just sent you a message. And I think a day later, you called me on your way to, to Vegas. And yeah. you sent me the film. And you checked it out. <laughs> and and uh, yeah. I'm, I'm, glad you, I'm glad you liked it. You know, it was just, uh, it's a very personal film. And, um, you know, just sharing my my uh my biohacks essentially what i did to to get where i am now and to kind of continue where i i, I want to get to in my evolution of of optimal health so awesome man well you know to, to share your story a little bit more yeah we talked on the phone and you know me i mean and i know you now and um you know people like us in this day and age right now really all sort to gravitate towards each other right now the energy of this planet as I say, you know, the energy of the spiritual central sun has been washing over this planet now as we change from the age of Pisces into the, into the age of Aquarius and people like us of a higher consciousness of a different unique energy uh, are all gravitating towards one another. So once you and I spoke on the phone, I just knew who you were. I felt your energy. I felt like your vibration. Um, and I just knew that I wanted to talk to you and help you obviously in any way that I can. And obviously my wife watched your podcast too. Um, and we were just both very compelled to like, obviously work with you, communicate with you, help you in any capacity. So obviously it's an honor to have you here today. And, um, you know, I think it's an amazing thing that what you're doing, because there's a lot of people in the world, um, who can aspire to obviously improve their vision. And you're kind of like, dude, like a real change maker, right? Like you're a disruptor. You're, you're the guy who's walking in that path right now. And really for a lot of people who don't know that you are yet, right? Because they haven't gotten to that level 
and some of the changes that you may be able to initiate, and I'm sure you will because you're a pretty determined dude, um, is going to help so many other people. But let me just ask you, um, before we get into some of the other points, like define for the audience, what, where are you right now with like seeing? Like I know your documentary talks about it really well in the very beginning, but just like right now, like how much can you even see? Because like when I look at you right now, if this person did not know you were blind, there would there'd be no, you know, and again, you, you don't have 100% blindness, but they wouldn't know to me at all, right? Because like I see your vision, I see you making eye contact with me. You know, you don't look like you have any kind of disfigurement with your eyes or in that area. But like, what is your percentage of uh, eye capacity or your eyesight right now? So what I kind of call it is an invisible visual disability. That's kind of this name I've been throwing around for it. I was born with a condition call it's genetic which you know we can talk about epigenetics and, and right. uh so it's called retinitis pigmentosa or rp for short R, uh you know so it, there's various different kinds of retinitis pigmentosa some so it manifests in different ways for for other people with that condition um basically i have my central vision so that's that's what i can see for for clarity but the way my RP affects me is I have a uh, tunnel vision. So I have uh, like a severe tunnel vision. So, you know, during the day, the scope is about 11 degrees. Then at night, that, that tunnel shrinks. So it, it's not fixed. It's, it's very based on available light. And, I, and I've had this condition probably for about 20 years. Uh, I did have cataracts as well and had both lenses replaced uh, 10 years ago. So I've also had that. Um, so that's what I've been dealing with. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty much looking through a, a, a tunnel my, my whole life. And uh, it's, it's put me through a lot of uh, challenging times dealing with it and, and figuring out what that means to me and, and hiding it too. Because that's what I spent most of my life is I didn't accept my disability or whatever you want to call it, the gift. Uh, and, you know, I hid it. So I, I did a, a great job at, at hiding it. So often people just don't know I'm, I'm blind. I mean, I have a white cane that I, you know, bust out in, in some areas like you know, air, airports or when there's just a lot of people, especially nowadays too, if, you know, if we're supposed to be social distancing, <laughs> it's so, you know, I'm like, I, I bump into people all the time and I say, I'm sorry. I didn't like some people like look at me funny, like, well, what are you blind? I'm like, yeah, actually I am blind. They're like, Oh, okay. Sorry. But, you know, the cane oh, is man, more of like an ID cane. So, um, but yeah, it's just a mix of, uh, that, that's pretty much how my vision works. But, you know, uh, I, I, I can see, but I can't see. And often people just think you're blind and you can't see. You know, there's so many different aspects to, to vision loss. And this is another part of what I like to do is just advocate that, you know, there's so many different aspects of vision. Just like just because I'm not wearing glasses doesn't mean, you know, uh, I'm, I'm not blind and plus there's different types of, of vision loss too so you know I, i'm in fact legally blind and uh i have a very specific way of seeing so it's funny i i think to myself if i was walking with you in public and somebody did that to you and i was rexing him i'd be looking at him like you better apologize to him like i'd be here like i'd be like your guardian like what the hell's the matter with you bro you know that kind of stuff but uh i totally yeah. get that I, that was the old jay i'm i'm the pacifist the righteous <laughs> the new the new the new j but 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 no but truthfully like i i feel you and i see you on that but let me ask you about your hearing because obviously you know you always hear about people that have like one of their senses um attenuated reduced is your hearing because of your gift of not having perfect sight like really attuned like do you have like an amazing sense of hearing I do. Luckily, I don't have uh, this other variant of of this vision issue that actually affects hearing. My hearing is really, really good. My I'm like daredevil, almost almost to the point where I think it's a it's a bit of a problem that I can hear like Wi-Fi routers oh. and uh, and other things. That's a gift, bro. That's absolutely yeah. a gift. As long as you don't hear people talking shit about you, that's when it's a real gift. Yeah. yeah. So my hearing's great, and it actually does, in fact fill yeah. in like my, my peripheral vision so it's uh my brain has adapted that's actually why i turned to djing i'm going to talk about that right. film too it's kind of how i started djing just you know love records and i had a good sense of where, where some music goes and you know i thought i could do that so, well let's talk a little bit about your documentary and you know first off um 
for everybody who watches the show, you absolutely, at the end of the show, we'll let you know how you can, guys can get it. Um, but you have to watch it. It's really, really good. I mean, it's, you know, you're definitely not some like amateur, you know, that just like put something together on YouTube, you know, and all these guys that put like Kajabi videos up and say, Hey dude, check out my do documentary. I mean, it's very well produced and, 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 and construct, I mean, uh, constructed and obviously the interviews. And I just like, I really like the, the nature. It, it was, it was, um, I like edgy things and I felt like you, it, it was compelling. Your story is compelling in and of itself, but just the way you presented it and the way you talk to people um, and just the way people like, you know, take you as a person um, in the documentary. So anyway, just my hats off to you. I, I really enjoyed it. As like I told you, like my wife and I literally watched it on the way home um, from Vegas because she flew up the next night. And on the way back, I think I, if I remember correctly, oh yeah, it was when, it was when, uh, it wasn't in December, it was in January because I was taking my daughter to a cheerleading event, which by the way, which is so funny, that's where she got COVID. So when she came back and we didn't know that she had it right, but she was down for five days and lost her voice and was really, really sick. And then my other daughter got it, but we know now that we're pretty sure that she had it with the antibodies and all that stuff, but that's a funny story. But yeah, that was in January. I was, for some reason I was thinking it was in December, but it was in early January. I think it was like the second week of January when you and I talked. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. 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 Okay. So but anyway, so talk about the documentary. <laughs> so basically about 10 years ago, I went on this, you know, journey of like, you know, I hit the wall and didn't know what to do with my life. I broke up with my, or, you know, my relationship ended with my ex-girlfriend and just didn't know where I was going to go, what was happening. And, you know, I always felt that some issues that I've had with, with my cognition were, was affecting my, my social life and my work life, et cetera. And then I just read this book by Dr. Deutsch called The Brain That Changes Itself and found out a bunch of stories of, of certain people with, uh, you know, learning difficulties, how they were able to reprogram their brain via neuroplasticity by doing these cognitive exercises and hearing the story about Barbara Aerosmith. Uh, she's the woman who changed her brain and developed the school. And I thought, man, I need to go to the school because I can totally relate to her and just, you know, dealing with uh, learning difficulties my whole life. I sucked at school and just thought I was stupid. And, but what, uh, but let me ask you that, what, what, because you're not stupid. Clearly, you're very intelligent and you have a very high conscious, which increases, which I've never, I never really talk about with people. That actually increases your um, adaptability um, in learning, both in every level of learning, which I, I think, as you know, there's emotional, there's, there's um, spatial, there's a lot of different levels of learning. But, but when you said you struggled in school, was it because of your sight? Like you just couldn't read certain things. You couldn't pay attention on the chalkboard, you know, old school. Well, you're, what, what was the real reason? My sight wasn't really, it was downplayed, you know, I was, I was it was downplayed. Like I really didn't, uh, you know, officially accept my diagnosis until I lost my driver's license. I was able to drive a car for, for, you know, from 16 to 21. Wow. So, and I drove perfectly fine, but it was always kind of hidden. But obviously if your vision is limited, you're going to absorb less information from a scholastic perspective. You're going to be reading right. also certain concepts like maths. I just didn't get, and you know, the whole education system. <laughs> and, so, I mean, in, in me fitting in, in, in that system, I, I was, uh, I was stupid. I didn't do well. Uh, you know, concentration, focus issues, and just the way you absorb information, or remember certain things. I just, it wasn't, it wasn't, for me you know right. and i just didn't fit into that system so i obviously you know i often say this i felt like i was the you know the stupidest smartest guy ever you know but uh you know I, I realized that there were some things that weren't uh connected properly in the way my brain does function so i thought you know there were some issues there, there's a role of, of how trauma there's trauma is a big factor too which dr gabra mate talks a lot about that so if, if, if your body's in like fight or flight your body's not going to think, Ooh, I, like, let's learn about math while I'm in a, yeah. I'm in a stress response. Yeah. So there, there's so many other factors. So just, that was just the beginning of, of this rabbit hole of, of learning that, you know, how to optimize my brain by reducing trauma, by uh, giving it the exercise it needed cognitively because my body was in such a fight or flight for such a long time. So it was all, that was the beginning of, of, of reprogramming, you know, the, un, the un, making the unconscious conscious kind of thing by, by all these factors. and. I got uh, connected to all these uh, experts and researchers just by, you know, really digging their work and, and 
you know, meeting them and just reaching out saying, Hey, I really liked your, you know, Dr. Gabramate is he's, he's, he's a pretty big deal now in terms of, you know, what, what he's talking about uh, with, with the, the collective trauma of, of the world, how we all kind of need to wake up because we're, you know, it's forming, you know, bad decisions that are going on right now. Um, yeah, and we're, and we're, we're, we're going to talk about that. You and I have already in depth talked about that. And that is more important than anything. And we're going to talk about that in this podcast. I mean, in my current book that I'm writing right now, <clears throat> which is called raising your vibration, which I don't think you know about. Well, you do because you're on my email list, but um, like I'm putting all my energy into that. And that's essentially the second chapter. And, you know, um, it's, it's, you know, specifically about love and trust of self and until you can integrate your trauma and we all have it. And, and it comes from past lives, current lives, experiences at birth, parents not loving us enough, blah, blah, blah. But until you can integrate that, and obviously yours is from a lack of, I can't see, I'm not good enough, I'm not worthy, whatever that translates into, um, you know, trauma, but you're right. And, and uh, it, we're going to talk more about that. And I, I agree with you. And uh, that was one of the real awesome parts of the documentary, because I, as I told you, I was just reading a book. It's actually over there. It's this book right here. Um, the, the Four Principles of Creation. Right. And this book is a lot of my current book, the Raising Your Vibration book. There'll be a lot of the tenets and principles that I will, you know, re uh, can discuss in my book, you know, from my learnings from that. But dude, it's all, it's all unintegrated trauma. Like literally the world's pain, the lower, the, you know, the vibration of the collective consciousness of humanity is down here, you know, below the line of integrity, 200, because of trauma because of unintegrated trauma. I mean, you and I have talked about this, but think about most people literally cannot take responsibility or accountability for themselves. It's so-and-so's fault. My parents didn't love me enough, blah, 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 and started a million different things, right? And so it's like, you're a guy who's like taking massive accountability for themselves. The average person is not gonna wanna do what you're doing, being blind. You know, you're attempting to like solve a dilemma that no one has ever solved through, through your work, you know, and obviously epigenetic change. But I mean, it, it, it's, 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 dude, it's, that's it, man. It, it, it's, it's integrating trauma and who knows how many lives it takes uh, and it's, how much work, right? There's a definite uh, factor in, in like even ancestral post-traumatic stress. Exactly. It, it's, and, and that's, some of these messages that I got from working with plant medicines as well, that it's not this kind of, it didn't start with me. Right. You know, and it goes down in my, in my, my DNA from some, you know, ancestral trauma that if I can find a way to uh, alleviate it, I can actually turn on this DNA switch and, uh, you know, unblock this vision issue, which I'm getting pretty close at, at doing it. And I've, I've spoken to Mark Wolin as well. He wrote that book, which is actually called, it didn't start with you. Pretty amazing. Talks a lot about the science of epigenetics and, and, uh, and how ancestral trauma works really fascinating. So. Yeah. Yeah, like they say, the statement, the sins of the fathers, you know, is carried on to the four, the four, the sons of the forefathers. And yeah, I mean, dude, it's mind blowing. You know, there's so, there's two chapters in this book about it, but just, you know, like, the easiest way for people to to understand it, I think, you know, who are not as consciously as awake or as advanced or as aware as you and I, you know, because obviously, and again, we're not better than anybody else, but we just do a lot of work on this and research on this. But if you look at the depression, and it's very relevant to now, but if you look at the last great depression in the world, which is in the 19, 1932s, technically when it started, but it really started before then. But anyway, it's defined from 32 to 46. The people that came out of that, which would have been like, our parents' parents, right? Yeah. Like our grandparents were basically in that time. Yeah. And their transgenerational trauma that they transferred into their children and even their children into us in a lot of ways was lim limitation, lack, and scarcity. Yeah. Because they came from a world where they literally were standing in line for food, bro. They had no money, there was no jobs. Like survival was literally standing in line to get food. So imagine the mindsets that they 
you know, had and then transferred over. And I mean, I have many stories. I'm sure you have many stories, but I think for people who don't understand what transgenerational trauma means, I think that's always a really good line in the sand to say like, look, they transferred this feeling of scarcity into their children. And then their children probably turned that over into me and you growing up, right? My mom and dad, dude, my dad is still has it programmed in him. Same. Right. Yeah. I mean, like I told you this, right. My dad would not get, as a well-off, multi-millionaire, retired guy, no financial concerns, would not pay a top orthopedic surgeon to do his hip replacement because he gets it done for free from, from Kaiser in, 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 you know, in the United States, which is literally Walmart, if not worse, of medical care, right? And someone like you and I, working with the top doctors in the world, you know, knowing the, the importance of like working with somebody who's like an expert, a true you know, thought leader in their sp space, when you don't have any financial issues, it's just insanity. But that's, that is limitation and scarcity mindset. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's, and what I want to do is empower people to say that we can, we can break this. And that's the whole point. Mm -hmm. You know, one, one big thing that we think is just so fixed is in fact, our vision. Like, why is it that you break your arm, you put a cast on, the body heals itself, but why is it anything to do with like wearing glasses? Everybody thinks you wear glasses and you're, you're, you have to wear them for the rest of your life. It's not the case. The body can actually uh, change the eyes. We yeah. just need to, give, you need to give them the right conditions. It might be a little more complex. Trauma is an actual factor in eyesight too. If something, if a trauma happens, say 10 feet away from you or like a mile away from you or in close sight, it's, it's known that the body unconsciously doesn't want to see it. So what is it not seeing it does? It blurs it out for you. Then you've got to wear glasses. So right. if you can actually alleviate the trauma and actually use a type of lens that allows your eyes to move, essentially you can, you can uh, fix the eyesight too. So there, there's, it's, it's a big factor. And, and our eyesight, nobody talks about this. The, the eyesight is so important. It's how you and I are looking at each other right now. It's how we interact with the world. But nobody realizes how important it is to, to maintain optimal eye health. And now we're getting things like, you know, these uh, LED screens, our phones, uh, junk light everywhere is frying our eyes. And nobody's talking about how to heal and, and save, save our eyesight. So, you know, I, I'm in the process of putting together with, with all these, you know, doctors and scientists that I know, I'm in the process of putting together like an online uh, holistic eye health summit. And I already have some good uh, guests on board. I'm just in the process of organizing. So there's, you know, more information to come. But it's going to talk about a lot of factors, peptides, trauma, uh, holistic modalities to, to cure uh, vision issues, uh, epigenetics, uh, how EMF plays a role in, in damaging and light, uh, syntonic light therapy. So this is, you know, I have that coming down the line as well. But you know, it's, it's, it's so important to, to, to like look after our eyes more, more, more than ever. So, yeah, I mean, I mean, I, if, if you didn't have your eyes, I would be yelling at you right now that you're not wearing your blue light protective glasses. Cause like, I literally, truthfully, if I don't wear these Victor now, especially where I live in Southern California with 5g, you know, the diode signal is everywhere now from it's emitting from downtown LA. They've admitted it. Like I will get a headache in 30 minutes, you know, and I just have an iMac, you know, whatever this is, I think an iMac 31 inch, which I bought about a year and a half ago, you know, which isn't even still like our, this isn't 720. I mean, this is 720p, like my, it's not 1080, but I mean, anybody that has a 4k or higher monitor nowadays, that screen resolution light rate or re reflectivity rate. And then also the blue light, dude, that shit is melting. I have a, I'm sitting in front of it. There's an open window right behind me beautiful and i have a, uh, I have uh iris on here right now so beautiful I'm, I'm, i was just kidding dude i i i know you're protected but like but the reality is is that most people don't and i always will tell people when they get on a podcast i'm like what the fuck are you doing they'll be like what are you talking about and they're like why are you not wearing a blue light protectivity glasses right now and they're like should i be and i'm like uh yeah i mean dude my vision myself i've never told you this but my vision i used to have 2010 fighter pilot eyesight like I'm, I'm now nearsighted. I absolutely cannot read a television screen, a theater. Not that that matters anymore because they're done.
But like, I literally have to wear glasses, reading glasses to watch or to read, you know, anything on a screen from far away. And again, it's from this, it's just from not doing protective things for my eyes. Um, for as long as I have been using screens and manipulating data, which has been at least a decade now of like really intense being in front of a screen every day. So yeah, dude, I mean, that's great. I, you know, let me know how I can promote that or be involved in that if I can in any way, but uh, let's talk a little bit about your, um, you know, obviously you talk about it in the documentary and you talk about all this stuff in your documentary, but let's talk about plant medicine and your experience. And you and I have had conversations about this. Obviously I'm a big proponent of it. Um, you know, my caveat, which doesn't apply to you, but you know, to people that are not in the right place, you know, in their life, victim consciousness, people, I, I, I always say like, be careful, right? Cause the plant, you know, this, a plant is an amplifier and if you're not in the right place, it's not going to just be like some amazing, you know, uh, transformative, you know, thing or experience it's it just amplify where you're at right now where your current vibration is so be very careful and as you know too many people today and obviously i want your opinion but too many people today um have commoditized the plant and you know with reality television shows and all the other bullshit and there's so many people out there that think it's like if they do ayahuasca or dmt or meo or whatever they do can name a million other things that they're just going to have this like godlike experience and they're going to be transformed to a soul level. And I'm, you know, obviously I've written about it, but I'm constantly telling people, I'm like, no, it doesn't work like that. You know, it's all about inner work and, you know, getting your vibration to a level where the plant will help you. But talk about your experience with plant medicine and how that really helped you. So the big things with that, you know, if I can say what you spoke to is the, the these medicines give you, what you need to know, not what you want. Exactly. So it, it, if you, if you have another plan for this, like you're going to get rudely awoken. It's and if like, you don't drive with that message, you're going to fucking hate it. It's you. not going to be good, dude. No, it's not. And the other thing set and setting is so important. Right. Your, your, your body itself also still needs the energy from like a, a you know, a spacesuit perspective. Sure. Through actually have the experience there's that and you know integration it is yeah. of of the messages that you did receive are a major key into bringing that back to to this realm so and a lot of people struggle with it they they get these messages they don't know what the heck how to process it and you know i mean i i started with it you know in 2011 well, I heard about it from Dr. Gabor Mate and I heard about it from Aubrey Marcus and I heard about sure. it from, you know, all those guys reading, uh, uh, what was that book? Uh, the cosmic serpent by, by Narby as well. Yeah, right there. But, yep. Yeah. And I was just like, you know, I want to, want to try that. And, yeah. uh, it's I that, just talked about that book because I'm reading, um, this book right now, which is like the follow-up. There's a big interview with Narby in this book, which by the way, I bought this book when I was in Peru last summer. Oh, and I forgot to read it because I was reading Children of the Light. But this is a phenomenal book. If you don't have this book, if you can get this, it's called Visionary Plant Consciousness. I'll send it to you, The Shamanic Teachings of the Plant World. But they interview all the top people, Terrence McKenna, Andrew Whale, Alex Gray, Cat Harrison, Darby, all of those guys. But but um, I didn't mean to cut you off, but that that... That is a very powerful and profound book, by the way. It is, it is, it is. Because it kind of brings a bit of the, you know, the science uh, to, to that, you know, the, the modality and, and the plants. Talks about what's happening from like a global experience, different exactly. cultures around the world, seeing the same things. And, you know, uh, it, it's, it, it's, it's very, very, very profound, very profound. And it's, uh, it changed my life. It actually, you know, I always quote this young Carl Jung quote, until you make the unconscious conscious, it'll direct your life and you'll call it fate, which I think is, we don't realize how much stuff is going on in the unconscious and how we need to, you know, bring that to our, our conscious level to sort of see how much of our traumas are affecting our life. And uh, these, these, you know, these medicines can, can really help bring that to the, the forefront to, to, to realign your moral compass. Yeah. So, and, and that's, that's what it's done for me. I mean, there's all, obviously, 
many other things too. I mean, I've worked, I mean, I have an interview with my, my somatic therapist. He's, if you would have tell, told me that I'd be doing a documentary with the scene with my, my therapist on camera, I would have thought you were crazy. Right. Right. You know, and there I am talking with her about, you know, like some pretty heavy stuff that's happened to me in my life. And again, it was just a no holds bar. Like I just, this is me and I, and just being as vulnerable as possible on the film. And that's what I wanted to come out. Cause I, I, I was done. I don't want to play that game anymore. Like this right. is me. So, right. uh, and that's, and that's what it's all about. And you know, the, and the plants taught me how to be vulnerable. They taught me the true meaning of, 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 of love just like love un, you know like no holds just like whatever that's it that's it it's all about love no so. i mean i mean yeah bro i mean like you know that's another podcast i mean you know so many people don't understand when we say unconditional love you know and again i use the statement ani a-y-n-e which is actually a word that's in all cultures. And, you know, the Mesoamerican people, the indigenous of like um, South America, Peru specifically the, in the uh, Atiplano, you know, they, they define unconditional love or Ani as divine re reciprocity. And what they mean by that is, is that all life is conscious and sentient. And, you know, in, in the West, you know, we don't look at rocks or trees or, you know, wind, water, rain as of, you know, life, uh, you know, as alive. And they tell you that, oh yeah, that everything in this ecosystem of mother earth and mother earth obviously is a very powerful, radiant, primordial living being. And it's like, when you recognize that everything is conscious, alive and sentient, then you really truly recognize what unconditional love is. And then you're not going to walk over and callously or carelessly step on an animal or a bug or a spider or any of that stuff, because like everything is alive, you know, and, and since when, you know, since I came back from Peru in uh, last July, I mean, I, you know, I tell people all the time, it positively, as you know, it transformed me. Um, it really energy. I was already in the walking the path as I call it, you know, t towards spiritual enlightenment, or at least attempting to, and that just transformed me. And like, I, I really started to recognize like what unconditional love meant. And it was really just, again, the divine reciprocity. It's like, you should have the same feeling for everything that is living, breathing being on this planet that you do for your wife or your children or yourself. And it's like, it's not, you know, so many people say, oh, you know, I love you or like, you know, you want to get to a state of unconditional love, but they don't really understand that what it means is it's like having love as a state of being. And I, and I think, you know, Dr. Hawkins, you know, obviously I, I have this on my wall and I always refer to this, but like he really talks about getting your consciousness level, you know, up into the 500 to the 540 range, which again, he defines as serenity or joy or love or reverence or whatever, but it's like, when you have that state of mutual respect for everything that's breathing, living, being alive, it comes back to you, right? It's just, again, as I write in my book, Living a Fully Optimized Life, it's, it's essentially quantum physics. It's the cosmic mirror. It's like what you put out in your feelings, your energy, your actions, your thoughts, your words is what comes back. And that's, that's truly when you have universal love or unconditional love or planetary consciousness, there's a bunch of different terms for it. And obviously, as you know, dude, that's where we got to go. That's where we got to get this planet to. And of course you can't get 80, 90%, but as Hawkins says in his book and, and, and um, the children of the light book. And then also in the Darby book it talks a little bit about this too. It's like, if you can get enough of the high conscious people vibrating at planetary consciousness, you know, unconditional love, Ani, then that can change the whole planet, right? Because as you know, the statement is, is like, it just takes, you know, a couple to raise all the ships in the harbor. And it's really, really true that we just got to get the planet, dude, right? From right now where, you know, the best people say it's like 12 or 15% to 20%. To get people to where you and I are thinking that way and get that to 20% of the planet feeling that way and we'll change everything, dude. Well, I mean, it's happening. I mean, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, there's no way in, in, that I 
would have even thought I'd be having half these conversations about right. you know, deep spirituality and right. psychedelic medicines. You know, you had, and, and now to look at the situation that's going on now, it, it's, a, it's a bit of a big double-edged sword in some sense, but some people are seeing it as like, you know, what the hell is going on, all this uncertainty, and other people are looking at it as like, this is the great awakening. Exactly. So, I mean, you had Magenta Pixie on, I, I, which was a great uh, interview, and I really dug it. And uh, she's, yeah, she's talking about the same thing. It's like the great awakening. So, it depends which way you want to look at it. I so. mean, it, 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 it is a great awakening, it, you know, at the same time, you know, and you know this, and I don't want to go too, too deep where we lose some of the people <laughs> who follow us. But, you, you know, you, you, the, the, the physical realm or the aspect of us in physical bodies, because like I say this in my book, and I'll say this in my new book, and I say this obviously on my website, and I say this to anybody who knows me. I mean, at base essence, dude, you and I are not these bodies. No. We are literally electrical discharge. We are whirring electrons, plasmatic fire. You know, as you know, when you do plant medicine or have done plant medicine, you feel when you get really into that, as I call, you know, the source field, you get into the frequency. It's just basically harmonics. You can feel who you are at base essence. It's like a, sl I felt like a slinky or I feel like a slinky. I mean, I, I can literally close my eyes and get right back into that state in 30 seconds with, you know, going silent, obviously from a lot of work, but it's like, when you know that, like, you recognize that this third dimensional physical experience, you know, with matter is just not important. And what is important is our soul, which is again, that, that electrical spark, those worrying electrons. And that cannot be, cause as you know, energy cannot be killed. It cannot be crushed. It doesn't die. It's infinite. You know, the energetic expression, it just continues and continues and continues. It's infinite. So it's like, once you recognize that, and you detach from this like attachment to your physical being and your physical manifestation and things and money and all those things. It's like life. I mean, again, it's my opinion, obviously, but life becomes a lot easier um, and you're much more capable of being, um, you know, excited and joyous and ecstatic and having those experiences because like you just don't have fear. I mean, think, Victor, think of all the people that you know and that I know in, the, in this world who literally live their lives based on the fear of death, the fear of like, you know, cause all really the fear of death is, is the fear of limitation. It's, you know, it goes back to this book again, you know, lack, limitation, scarcity. Like it's a finite level of, you know, from point A to point B, I'm going to be gone at point B. And it's like, that just precludes you from truly being in this like, wow, experience of like happy go lucky state of like, well, whatever happens to me, this is interesting. Wow. Let me enjoy this. Because you're thinking about, I'm going to die at this point. So I got to do all these other things first before I die. Does that make sense? It does. The universe never gives an experience of non-existence, though. And we have to realize that, you right. know. And, um, and a lot of these things are difficult for people to understand because they're concepts you can't see. You can't see your emotions. You can't see quantum like things that are happening on a quantum biological level. Right. You know, so they just we're such, we live in such a Newtonian society where they, everyone just needs to see things to believe it. And uh, there's so much, I mean, that's why people have a difficult time again with the, the, the whole EMF thing or, you know, the, the uh, 5G stuff. Yeah. Whatever. So yeah, just cause you can't see it doesn't mean it's not there. No, so, it's... and um, it's, yeah, it's, it's, and that's kind of what I'm here to, to, to awaken people to, to see, you know, that's what I learned from going blind, essentially, just because you can't see it doesn't mean it's not there. Well, I mean, I like your comment of like, you know, going, going blind or, you know, the, the process of going blind has truly taught you how to see. And that, you know, is obviously one of the kind of the mythos or the overarching narrative of your um, documentary, which again is awesome. Um, but, you know, just to end the show and, and you know, tell people how people can buy it and, and, and obviously connect with you and stuff. And there's obviously a lot of people that may want to podcast with you that watch my podcast too. So, you know, let them know how they can connect with you in that way. But um, what do you think, because we didn't talk about this whole COVID debacle and all this shit. We're obviously in all this indecision and the world's changing. But like you said, the great awakening. And obviously I agree with you. We are having this massive transformational 
experience, depending on your level of consciousness, whether you're here or here, is different. You know, your your feelings of it or your experiential aspect of it is a little bit different, but it is a definite transformation. Where do you see, and I'll get into your opinion, but where do you see society going in the next, say, year to three years, and then just big picture after this? Like, are we headed on a very positive path now? Or do you think we, you know, as the ancients would say, like before we move into this quote unquote golden age, there's darkness before dawn. Cause obviously a lot of people right now could, could paint and argue a very cogent one at best that says that we're moving into a world of tyranny and more surveillance and more, you know, oversight by the overlords. But do you think that truthfully it's just a short term thing and that all of this is going to lead to a better world? Wow. Uh, good, good question. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> you know, we're we're at a crossroads of uh, consciousness and catastrophe right now. That's a great comment. And uh, you know, I love to think that we are going to make the right decision and and take the the right road to to get to this universal peace happy happiness and understanding uh some days i'm i'm a little uh shaken by it and not sure where it's going and then you know again there's there's the, I, I do feel like there's some right people talking about what we need to do to, to kind of get to this space and you know I, I'm, I'm still a bit unsure to be honest with you where i think it's gonna go i i hope so uh, again, I'm talking to a lot of people who are, you know, on my level of of thinking, sure, my opinion about about where it's going to go, and that this is the Great Awakening, and, and a lot of people are, you know, saying their opinions on, you know, uh, I'm scared to say some certain words now because <laughs> no, dude, you can say whatever on this podcast. Yeah, like, it's a Jay Campbell podcast, bro. You can say whatever. Yeah. The V word, va- you know, uh, yeah. vaccines and, you know, just, just, just corruption. Oh, no, we have no universal vaccine role in this one. So you can talk about vaccines all you want. And as you know, and I've said this, and I know you said this too, I've already gone on record on social media and I said, over my dead body. I it's- will not accept a universal vaccine and neither will my daughters who have never been vaccinated. 10 and 12, be- bundles of light and joy. And so if it comes down to that, bro, I'm gone. I'm up and out. You're not going to do it. You can't mandate it. You can't force me. I mean, we're not getting in get into that, but yeah, I mean, yeah. th- 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 you know, th- those things are a joke. They do not offer any form of immunity. You know, there's been many books written about pathology and blood. You know, the, san- there was the best one ever was the sanctity of human blood. And they interviewed all the top, you know, pathologists of the world in the nineties. And they said that um, immunization slash vaccinations are a scam that the Mm -hmm. belief that you can create immunity by injecting the vax, I mean, the disease and the antibodies of the disease and the viral viral agents of the disease and the pathogens and all that is nonsense. It's just a hope. There's no science. And again, as you know, the CDC, because they want to make money and various other agencies of governments have created these, you know, lies and this mythos. And then they brainwashed, you know, as I call it, you know, the orthodoxy to, Mm -hmm to buy in. And you and I both know, how do you buy in? How do you get doctors to buy in? Well, you pay them. Yep. Yep. And that's where we're at, bro. And, you know, I didn't want to make this a debate or even, you know, take your answer off about vaccines, but if people would just look a little bit deeper and get to the level where you and I are and do plant medicine and search and experience and open your mind, you would realize it's all a scam. Mm -hmm. No one of science can prove that those things do anything, you know, and I've had a lot of people, by the way, great, great. I'm glad you said it because it gave me a nice platform to say this, but I've had a lot of people that come to me and say, but Jay, you know, you and Victor, you guys are older guys. You guys are, you're 40, right? How old are you? I'll be uh, 42 in September. 42. So I'm 49. So our generation, you guys got the diphtheria vaccinations and polio and you know all those back then and those were needed and stuff so how can you say what you're saying about vaccinations and i'm like no they weren't needed it was bullshit experimentation even then like we now know scientifically that cleaning your hands has a better effect 
from, you know, all of those horrific, unhygienic, you know, the things that caused dysentery and all these things that were happening in the 30s and 40s and 50s when they created the vaccines that weren't necessary and it just became a scam in medicine. And I'm sorry that I went long-winded, dude, and I said that, but. I don't know, I mean, and no, nobody talks about, uh, at the same time, you know, the, the advent of plumbing. Exactly. And that, and that was, you know, that was huge. Nobody talks about that, just general sanitation. You know, we, we know that. And also nobody talks about the, the advent of certain other, you know, like how AM radio existed oh, back yeah, then, and how that was a major issue. And now people, people are talking about, you know, the same thing, you know, like 5G is the, uh, the C-19's a scapegoat for, for this, you know, 5G deploy, uh, you know. Dude, you're so right. I mean, I'm actually reading a book called the um, the Re the Electrical Universe, um, and then a couple other books on just the idea. I can't think of the other one I'm right now, but it was sent to me. But yeah, I mean, radar technology and those rays and that energy that was put into our universe has just distorted the auric fields of humanity, and obviously the Schumann resonance, which is obviously the auric field of the planet. Yeah. And we have just constantly disturbed it, but that's a whole other topic for a whole other day. Dude, this podcast has been amazing. I'm really glad that you talked about some of the things that you talked about. If people want to work with you, podcast with you, obviously watch your documentary, which I highly recommend. What's the best way for them to do that? Well, the documentary is available in Canada right now. I'm in Canada uh, on the AMI channel. It's the, uh, that's where it got, premiered this is the network that, that bought the tv version we have a full feature film film cut that's the one you saw right it uh we just got distribution on itunes so just because the c19 stuff uh it, it we don't have an official date yet but i will tell you as soon as i find out about the date uh if somebody's really 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 itching to want to watch it they can send me a message and uh perhaps i can send them a, a private link uh i can be found on Instagram, uh, my handle is Blind Biohacker. We have a website, uh, myneuroplasticadventure.com. I'm also can be found at uh, selfoptimize.io. But and uh, Facebook is just my full name, Victor John Andrew Mifsted. So um, yeah, you can find me on uh, Instagram. I'm quite active on there. Send me a message. That's like the only social media that I'm not and I'm not active on. And I do, I did, my social media company was active for me and they went out of business since this debacle. Oh. So <laughs> I actually thankfully hired one of their agents that they let go. Uh, but you know, that's, we didn't talk about that, but I mean, as you know, the service industry has been routed by this man. So many people that worked in service, marketing, uh, advertising, anything that was like entrepreneurial food service has just been toast from all of this, no. you know, so, um, but yeah, dude, awesome. Um, so blind biohacker, um, I will have to follow you on Instagram when I go on Instagram, but, uh, brother, I really appreciate you, Victor coming on today and sharing your story. It's phenomenal guys, please obviously as always support the amazing people that come on this podcast. You guys can go to uh, both of his websites, which is self optimized.io and my neuroplastic adventures.com. Yeah. You can also connect with him on social media at blind biohacker on IG or on Facebook, which is Victor John Andrew Nifsud and his uh, documentary, which is my neuroplastic adventure will be out soon on iTunes. So please again, support him and remember raise your vibration to optimize your love creation. We will see you guys very soon.